Today's second reading continues where our first reading stopped. Remember that Paul and Silas have come into Philippi. They've met this, uh, this slave girl who has a spirit, and she's predicting the future, and she's making money for her owners, and they cast out the spirit, and now the owner's mad, and they've been beaten, and they've been stripped, and they've been thrown into jail. And we pick up that story in Acts chapter 16 with verse 25 and see it through to its thrilling conclusion. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was an earthquake so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. Now when the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself since he supposed that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted in a loud voice, Do not harm yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for lights, and rushing in, he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them outside and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They answered, Believe on the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. At the same hour of the night, he took them and washed their wounds. Then he and his entire family were baptized without delay. He brought them up into the house and set food before them, and he and his entire household rejoiced that he had become a believer in God. When morning came, the magistrates sent the police saying, let those men go. And the jailer reported the message to Paul, saying, the magistrates sent word to let you go. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. But Paul replied, they have beaten us in public, uncondemned men who are Roman citizens and have thrown us into prison, and now they're going to discharge us in secret. Certainly not. Let them come and take us out themselves. The police reported these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. So they came and they apologized, and they took them out, and they asked them to leave the city. After leaving the prison, they went to Lydia's home, and when they had seen and encouraged the brothers and sisters there, they departed. Friends, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord endures forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be So friends, here we are on the midpoint of our six-week journey through Paul's call to faith and ministry, and our desire to not only hear those same calls in our lives, but more importantly, to answer them in a way that allows us to grow in our relationships with God as living, breathing, passionate, committed, 21st century disciples of Jesus Christ. And to be perfectly honest, as we share today's call... I have to tell you that this might be my favorite of the six, because today, for me, is a day when Paul's journey hits most closely to home for me. The day when Paul's life and ministry looks a little less like some storybook written with perfection in mind, and a little more like the lives we lead just about every day. Because remember how we first met Paul, right? Week one, just to catch us up, Paul experiences God's call to faith in Jesus Christ in a great dramatic way. And I know most of us have not experienced that, the bright white light, the voice of God speaking to us from the light, followed by three days of blindness and then a 180 degree turnaround in our life's mission and purpose. But all of us have experienced God's call to follow Jesus Christ in some way, shape, or form. Because all of us have been called to not only know the love of God, but share the love of God with others. So we are comfortable with that first call, that call to follow Christ. And then last week, we picked up Paul's faith and ministry in his first missionary journey. He experienced God's call to go, so he went. And things went pretty well during that first missionary trip. Paul traveled hundreds of miles with his friend Barnabas. They met some resistance along the way, but for the most part, his message was well received. A whole lot of people came to faith in Jesus Christ. New churches were established, and all was fairly well in Paul's world. So we can appreciate still today that God calls us to go, 
to places both familiar and new to us, sharing the message of faith that we're all sinners, but that God loves us, God forgives us, and in Jesus Christ, God offers us the free gift of life eternal. But then today comes along, and Paul hits, I guess we'll call it a snag, although it's a lot more dramatic than that. Because now, all of a sudden, the wheels feel like they may be falling off this journey of faith for Paul as resistance against and within the early church is starting to rise up. People are bickering over the finer points of life together in the church. Church leadership is arguing with one another. Relationships are broken. Enemies of the early church are riling folks up against this movement of faith. And guys like Paul find themselves in, I guess we'll call it a challenging situation. While this certainly doesn't shock us if we're familiar at all with the way folks tend to act in the church or we're just familiar with basic human nature, still this internal and this external resistance presents a very real threat to derail this whole thing and throw the future of this young faith movement into total doubt and utter despair. But as I said earlier, this is my favorite week of the call so far, because now, for the first time for me, things are getting real. Because whether we are newcomers to the life of faith or we've been living among the church and its ministry for our whole lives, for better or worse, these challenges, these difficulty, these personality conflicts and petty arguments, this call to suffer is something that's familiar to us. This is our ground. We know the lay of the land here. We've seen this in our own lives. We've experienced this in our own churches. This part of God's call, it is familiar to us. After all, when everything's going well, including here in the life of faith, the life of the church, is it really all that difficult to make the decision to follow Christ? And is it really all that difficult when everything's going perfectly well to follow God's call to go? It's when we experience this next phase of the journey, that, that call to suffer, that call to endure seasons of life that test us, that challenge us, those times when, when things don't go our way, those seasons when life seems strangely void of all the good and wonderful things that we long to experience, those times and those seasons of suffering. When the call to live our faith comes in the midst of times that we don't like to talk about, when the call to faith is challenging, it's then that things get real and we find out just how much we are willing to trust the gift of faith in our world and in our churches, in our hearts, and in our own lives. Friends, the reality of the life of faith is that nowhere in God's witness to us, nowhere in Scripture does God promise us that we are somehow immune to suffering and to pain. Whether it's due to our own sinful choices or the sinful choices of others or just the sinful nature of the world that we share, we will always in our lives find ourselves in seasons of suffering, just like Paul. Remember, Paul's suffering began with people arguing over ideas. Sound familiar? Ever experienced that? Here the early church is growing more and more popular among both Jews and Gentiles, and so disagreements, arguments are breaking out in the church between various parts of the church and its leaders over how much of the Jewish law these new Gentile converts should follow. Now remember, we mentioned a couple weeks ago, a lot of the early Christians were, were mostly faithful, practicing Jews. So as suddenly non-Jewish people began coming to faith in Jesus Christ, this debate started to rage about just what laws these new folks had to follow. And an all-out war breaks out in the church, oddly enough, or not if you are a man among us and understand this, the war is over circumcision. The first sign of suffering in the early church comes as key leaders of the church try to figure out where they stand on this debate. Do new converts to the Christian faith have to do this circumcision thing that the Jews have been practicing for generations. And so our man, Paul, finds himself at odds with one of the great leaders of the early church, Peter. Remember Peter? Anybody? Yes. Don't be afraid. It's the Peter you're thinking of. 
It's the Peter who was the disciple whose confession of Jesus Christ as the Messiah, the Son of the living God, was the confession of faith that God said, I will build my church and nothing shall stand against it. But now Peter and Paul are going at it. No holds barred, yelling at each other, writing letters back and forth. And this season of suffering is fully engaged over ideas, over rules, over whose version of faith and life will win out for the church. Now, Paul's side wins the argument. Gentiles do not have to be circumcised, but the damage is done. The church has begun to fracture over differences of ideas, but that season of suffering is just beginning because now Paul starts to experience the suffering of broken relationships. Last week, there was a little verse buried in the second scripture reading about how on that first missionary journey, Paul and Barnabas' friend, John Mark, didn't finish the journey with them. And it might not seem like a big deal then, but now as Paul starts to prepare for his second journey, this time he doesn't want to take the guy that didn't finish things with them. But Barnabas says, yeah, we want John Mark. And now Paul and Barnabas, these men that have shared this great friendship for over a decade, have split up because they can't agree on whether this guy should go with them or not, and their relationship is broken. Again, sound familiar? How many of us have reached those snags, those roadblocks, those hurdles in our Christian faith because we found ourselves in a season of difference over ideas and beliefs or because we've been hurt by broken relationships with people we love and care for? It happens, friends. We know this. We've experienced this. Sometimes we get so wrapped up in our own sense of self that we neglect the truth that our journeys of faith are always shared with other people. So here's Paul, no longer with his best friend in faith and his favorite traveling partner. The early church is fracturing over competing ideas of how to live this thing called faith. So Paul feels that the time is right to go on a second trip. He's going to go back to a lot of the places that he went the first time, essentially going back to strengthen and confirm the faith of all these small pockets of the church that he has begun. A new cast of characters enters our story. We meet people like Lydia, the seller of purple cloth. We meet people like Silas and Timothy, who will reappear later in Scripture. And if this season of suffering over competing ideas and broken relationships isn't enough, Paul makes his way to Philippi. And when he does, he begins to be annoyed by this young girl, a fortune teller, who made money for her master by telling people the future. And every time Paul goes out to preach the world, there is this girl yelling and shouting about who Paul is. And while she's right, Paul lets his humanity show through a little bit. And he gets what they say in Scripture, very much annoyed. So he, he's angry. Because every time he preaches, there's this woman sitting in the back of the church, shouting and screaming, Brian, thanks for not being that woman. So he gets so annoyed that he casts out this spirit in her, and now she can't tell the future anymore. The owner of this young girl gets upset, right? As you would imagine, because now she can't make money for him. He gets so mad that he has Paul and Silas dragged before the authorities. They strip him naked, they beat him with rods, and they throw him into prison. Now, I would argue this is like full-blown suffering now. Yes? doesn't get much worse than this. You've been arrested, stripped, beaten, thrown into prison for who knows how long. And it's here that we reach, for me, the important part of today's call. That call to suffer isn't a lesson about how we should go out and find ways to, to suffer greatly for our faith in Jesus Christ, to somehow prove that our faith is, is big enough and good enough to suffer for God. But it's also not a message about how grateful we should be when those seasons of suffering come. Somehow, like, we have to prove that our faith is true because we're willing to sit in those places and seasons of suffering to show just how much we love God. Now, friends, neither for me is the, the take home. Instead, it's this. Caught up in a massive controversy over beliefs and practices of the early church. Living in the midst of broken relationships with one of the most important people in his life, Barnabas, 
At odds with one of the most revered and well-respected men of the early church, Peter, now Paul has been arrested, stripped, beaten, and thrown into jail. He is suffering like never before, but what is Paul doing in prison? As they sit locked away inside a Philippian jail, tired, sore, beaten, bruised, and exhausted, what is Paul doing? What are Paul and Silas doing as they sit there in jail? Does anybody remember? Yes, I heard them both. This is great. They're praying and they're singing. So what are they doing ultimately? They're worshiping God. At the absolute lowest moment of their lives, Nothing is going well. All the progress they've made seems like it's slipping away. They're fighting with the leadership of the early church. They're at odds with one another. They're best friends and partners in faith. Now they've been beaten, stripped, and thrown in jail, and they're doing the only thing that makes sense to them to do in that moment. They're worshiping God. Now, I don't know about you folks, and it certainly wasn't the case with our young disciples, But when we ask them to describe what it means to be a suffering people, guess what nobody said? Being a person who's worshiping, right? It was all negative feelings. If everything around us is falling apart at the seams and we feel like like nothing is going the way that we want it to go, it's natural for us to panic. Maybe we start whining and complaining. Maybe we fold our arms and stomp our feet and we get mad at God. But Paul doesn't set that example, does he? In the lowest point we've found him so far in this journey of faith, Paul and Silas are worshiping in jail. And long story, a little bit shorter, there's a great earthquake. Paul and Silas and all these other prisoners have a chance to escape, but they stay in prison voluntarily. Paul might be losing his mind now. They keep worshiping God in the midst of this terrible season of suffering. And the end result is that the jailer is so impressed with what he's witnessed, so remarkably moved by their complete and utter faith and devotion to Jesus Christ, worshiping God in the lowest of low moments that the jailer and his entire family, what does it say about midnight? So impressed that he says, what do I have to do to have that kind of faith? And right there, midnight. The whole household's baptized. They share a meal. They take care of each other. Glenn, did you hear? But wait, there's more. Huh? Because the response that Paul and Silas have to suffering in their lives, while radically different than what most of us would do, is to worship God. That's it. No fighting, no arguing, no begging, no pleading, no looking for someone to solve their issue, but simply they worship. They pray, they sing, and because of their witness, praising God in the midst of this season, the church of Jesus Christ grew. People came to faith. What if, when those seasons come in our lives, and they will come, many of us are in them right now, what if when those seasons come, personally or professionally, What if when they come socially or in the life of the church, what if instead of going out or staying in and tearing our own faith apart, tearing each other apart, going out and telling everybody everything that makes us miserable in the world, what if we prayed? What if we sang? What if we worshiped God? What would the story of our lives and the story of our faiths And the story of the life and ministry of Old First Presbyterian Church look like if even in the lowest moment we will ever share on our own or together as a family of faith, we choose to worship. So friends, when that season comes, we have a choice to make. We can give up, we can give in, or we can worship. We can pray, we can sing hymns of praise. We can allow our response to be faith, hope, and trust in the God who is bigger than our suffering. The God who will indeed deliver us in our season and by trusting and believing in this God who will ultimately save us all, we might just draw others into this life of faith. Friends, I can only hope and pray that for all of us, when our season of suffering comes, that we too will look not down at the things that are holding us back here, but up to the heavens 
and continue to answer our call to follow Christ, our call to go out and share our faith with others, embrace that moment with a spirit of worship, praise, and thanksgiving, knowing that even in our suffering, God is still God. Thanks be to God. Amen.